Hello, everybody. It's the day after the halving for Bitcoin. This is as bad as Y2K. Power is out. Only the force of my incredibly high Metachlorian count is keeping me online. All the color is faded from the skies. All the computers are off. There's no electricity. There's sudden food shortages. Medical care has ceased as doctors run away from hospitals because of zombies. All because of the Bitcoin heavy. It's just destroying, destroying the world. Jamie Dimon taking a victory lap. Charlie Munger is laughing in his grave. They told us Bitcoin was going to destroy the world. And now it's happening. See where I am. Not really the end of the world. So Bitcoin having occurred yesterday and today overnight, basically, and we're not seeing Bitcoin go up a thousand percent or down a thousand percent. We did see a pretty good day on Friday for the Bitcoin mine. So I would just encourage you, while Bitcoin is chopping along here, waiting for markets to digest some things, to think about what you believe Bitcoin is. I believe Bitcoin is the next global currency. I believe that it will be much like a euro for emerging markets and others who want to store value there and have a hedge against the dollar. If you've been following the news, one of the things that you have seen on Bloomberg or the Wall Street Journal or the Financial Times is that there are a lot of countries right now showing a lot of angst with the dollar being so strong. I've showed chart after chart that show if the dollar breaks above about 108 on DX, DXY, then you get a much deeper correction. It's currently flirting with those levels. I will be discussing the dollar on Friday with Forex Analytics. So if you get a chance, you can watch their show at 7.30 in the morning. It's called The Face Interviews. Uh, I have a face, so they invited me on again. I think it was about the 10th time I've been on. Last time was in September. And we're going to talk about the dollar. Now, the dollar has a direct correlation to the stock market. And back here, two months ago and one month ago, I warned you on this channel that there was a correction coming in the second quarter. I was just a couple days early with the correction starting on March 20th, started the following week. Now the S&P 500 is under 5,000. I said it would get into the 470s, 4700s, 470s on a spy, and we'll see. I don't believe the higher for longer narrative. I believe it is a narrative that the Fed is pushing because they want to see a small correction to take some air out of this market make it a little bit more discerning versus purely speculative. I have a couple interesting topics to cover today before we get to uh, the slide chart. So I would strongly encourage you to go back, listen to these webinars, because I think they're very instructive. They were timely. And the message I would have for you today, by the end of the show, hopefully you believe me, is that this correction will only, only last about two weeks to two months. I suspect closer to two weeks. However, it could be two months. We'll see. We'll see how much turnover there is. It will depend on whether Jay Powell is mean Jerome Powell or nice Jerome Powell on May 1st. We do know that they will be discussing reducing quantitative tightening. I wrote an article a year and a half, two years ago that explained to people that it's not so much the interest rate, but the money supply, which quantitative easing and tightening directly impact, that was the big deal. I've showed charts recently that show that if money supply goes down much longer or, or much more, we put ourselves at risk for a very large recession and possibly a depression. The Federal Reserve has got to get off the sideline at this point. I think that they should take the half point off on May 1st. I think the earliest they'll do it is June, and they might do it in July. But everybody banging the inflation drum is wrong. They've been wrong for 40 years. I will continue to say that. I have people say things to me like, oh, well, it's Econ 101 that if they print money, blah, blah, blah. But then they don't acknowledge that the money supply has been dropping for a year and a half. Granted, it started from a pretty big number after the COVID bailouts. However, we are now inching towards a danger zone, and we have to make sure that doesn't accelerate into a sprint, which means that you need to change direction. If we don't, I'm on board with Mohamed El Arian. If this Fed really doesn't lower interest rates soon in the next few months, you are going to see a doozy of a recession, maybe starting as soon as next year. And it will be potentially as bad as the financial crisis if it is not addressed the right way. If they meet the next recession with more tax cuts for the wealthy and then flattening out support programs for the not wealthy, 
then you see a depression and you see social deconstruction in the United States, worse than you've seen it. If we rebuild the world, things get better pretty quick. So we'll see how it goes. You know what my fear is. My fear is that we get somebody in there, in the White House that is, that wants to cut taxes on the wealthy. It's the only place that there is money right now. The better approach is not so much to raise taxes on them. It's to incentivize investment in real projects versus skimming the market. And there needs to be enforcement in a couple of areas of securities. It isn't being done right now because the Fed commissioner is obsessed with Bitcoin when he should be obsessed with rampant coordinated trading, much of it using insider information, gets passed along to create a degree or two or three of separation in a web of favors and manipulations that Paul Simon described as a loose affiliation of millionaires, billionaires, and babies. And I would consider a new translation for that would be massive trading platform, Citadel, others like it, private equity funds and hedge funds, Carlisle, then all the little traders in the trading room figure I'm too little to draw the attention of it. And I would call out to the Securities and Exchange Commission to start enforcing that. We know what's happening. It is easy enough to go click, click, click onto the internet and then figure it out. So for the SEC to not prioritize policing the markets for short attacks, for manipulation of small and micro cap stocks, is frankly a crime. And I think that it's about time that Gary Gensler is fired for not doing his job for being so wrapped up in ignoring Bitcoin while vilifying it, but at the same time approving ETFs to trade in it, that he is so far over his skis from lack of experience and being locked in academia, which is a criticism you know that I very rarely make, that he needs to be gone. That all said, the story remains when interest rates come down, very good for micro caps and small caps. We just have to see when it happens. So go ahead and watch these two webinars. I did publish an article to the free side of Seeking Alpha, put it out on a Friday afternoon so it hasn't got looked at much. But I am going to social media blitz this one and I encourage you to share this to any social media where you have more than two or three followers. I'm going to make similar piece free over at Fundamental Trends but this is the one that the forward because it gets on to the Seeking Alpha ecosystem which is pretty darn big. So if you can forward this, I uh, modified it to only really talk about a Metis and Spire Global because I didn't want to do whole research piece or make this 7,000 words. Talk about how the microcap to Russell 2000 inclusion work. It's going to be around $185 million for market cap to get put onto the Russell 2000. You do have to be a U.S. company. Somebody asked about a foreign company, and unless they're U.S. domiciled and doing the majority of their business in the U.S., that's not how it works. It's a U.S.-based index. Talked about position sizing. These are the companies from smallest to biggest that I'm invested in. All of these companies are potentially billion-dollar companies. These two are the biggest right now. They're going to get on the Russell 2000. The ones in the 200s are very probable. And then these three, Radcom, Ametis, and QuickLogic are close. A couple of weeks ago, Ametis was at $230 million in market cap. So you see how much volatility is in these stocks. I would say that over the next two weeks, you really want to accumulate these. I'll probably buy more Radcom and QuickLogic because there's really no downside to them, even if they don't get on Russell 2000 at this point. They're very interest rate dependent at this point because the narrative is that inflation is the main thing to worry about. It's not. But that the Fed isn't going to lower rates this year. They will. So I did a little bit more on a Metis here. Quick little update. But I want to point to Spire Global because this really plays into the idea of scaling in small and slow on the front end. So we bought Spire Global at 7 bucks a share, split adjusted, like 50. Right now it's about 10. Oh, well, you got your ass kicked. You're down 80%. No, I'm not. I barely can see that. I had such a small position in Spire Global on the front end, and we waited until around last Labor Day to really buy in, which was close to the absolute bottom. That my average price is five dollars and twenty cents. Because I had a nibble, watched it go down for two years, a ton, just held on to the starter position. I did trade in and out of it in some taxable accounts, and then loaded up at the absolute bottom to bring my average cost basis down to five twenty. And even with the price almost doubling for me. I don't have a huge position. So you can do the math, but I really only had a position in the 3% range at my maximum position size. Some accounts 4% and then I trim. This is why you buy fractional percentage ownership when you start to scale into a stock. Now the story here is that the shorts attacked this company for a long time, played on the idea that 
hey, people get impatient, all Gartner hype cycle stuff, and then they dump stock. They don't really hold them for long. Average stock holding period in America is 10 months. Dumbest fucking statistic in the market. And that's why we get such huge volatility in stock prices. We saw Supermicro drop, what, 20% this week? A month after everybody was saying it's the next in the NVIDIA. And NVIDIA dropped, what, 10%. But, 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 but it's a great company. But, 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 but. So when you ask about why did a price go up or down today, and I say... And I respond, it's just traders being traders. And you go, ah, yeah, but there's a reason. No, there's no fucking reason other than zucking. I'm sorry, I'm supposed to be saying zucking. Other than there is money at the margin. And what do we know about money at the margin? That's what sets price, right? That's Econ 101. And they move the price of a stock. Because as you've seen in the very short list, at the end of that chart that I give you is a column it shows how much stock is actually trading in a day as a percentage of the float. And you'll notice that those numbers are virtually always single digit, sometimes less than 1%, despite a big move in share price. Why is that? It's because a majority of the stock held in the market, especially the S&P 500, is institutional. doesn't really trade. So if you get X millions of dollars trading in a space that is dominated by retail investors, right, the float that's tradable, you have to take out all the stuff from the institutional investors because it doesn't move. They don't trade it. They just hold it. The actual market cap that's available to be traded is much smaller. And therefore, it takes a thinner wallet to move it. And when a group of traders in the trading room or on Discord or wherever they are get fed an idea by a hedge fund that got it from somebody bigger, they become the money at the margin and they all run in one direction. And then retail investors who don't understand the quant math, they don't understand the math behind it, Oh, there must be something bad going on. Oh, tell me why it happened. I'm telling you why it happened. They are manipulating the math. They are manipulating the dollars in the market. They are naked shorting. They are using margin and options to amplify their impact. And then retail investors go, oh, and I got to sell. And you invariably sell at the bottom. If you don't understand what I just told you, stop managing your own money. If you don't accept what I just told you, stop managing your own money. Hire me or buy an index fund. I just told you what's happening, and I'm not the only one. TJ Rogers, officer and CEO at a couple companies, discussed, somebody posted this in our chat room on margin of safety investing. What's going on in the shorts? What's what, How shorts are impacting stocks? In this particular example regarding Solaria, it was probably insider information. They got shared, one degree of separation, and then passed on a second degree of sep separation. And the stock of Solaria got crushed. Enovix, Ametis, Fire Global. Fire Global's less the case. But if you take a look at the short interest on micro caps and small caps that are getting beat up, you'll see that it's been increasing. And that's what's happened. So I said, well, what was in the news that made that happen? Nothing. Retail investors have soft hands. They're emotional. They sell when things go down. Because, oh, it's going down. I got to get rid of it. I'll just take the 4% in my money market account. If that's how you think, don't handle your own money. Because you are playing a game without knowing the rules, without having the emotional fortitude. Just be invested in what you want to be invested in, what you know, what you can see the future of. And that's really what investing is, is can you see the future? I've gotten pretty damn good at it. I think it's important that you find a way to turn volatility into an opportunity. Because if you can't, you're just going to keep buying high and selling low, which is the opposite of what you want to do. Now, picking out pivot points is hard, which is why you have to scale in slowly. And when you get a big rally, you trim out a little bit. And you don't have to be perfect when you rebuy. But when, and this is the shortcut, when the weekly relative strength index gets overbought and then jitterbugs around that overbought area, right, giving you different drives and price levels, you trim into that. And then when it drops back down, it may not necessarily get oversold. Sometimes it only gets to the mid-range. And that's indicative of a very strong uptrend. You start to buy again. You don't have to be perfect. Very, very slow, small incremental buying and selling around your core position. So my core position is always just the starter position. And then I trade around that, which is why with Spire Global, the 1% went down to like, you know, two tenths of a percent. But then I loaded up because we found sideways chopping market that really reasonably couldn't go any lower because company had some value, even if they parted it up and closed it, which is what you look for. And really any company that trades for book value, you start buying, right? So if they shut the doors and sell it off, 
about even. And that really even holds true for any time a company is trading for less than about two times book value. Unless it's just a crap business, in which case it wasn't on your list to begin with. All right, big thoughts. Mohamed El Arian says the world is frozen by the strong U.S. dollar and high U.S. rates, which is what I started to talk about earlier on. This is Forest for the Trees. He covers quite a bit of material. Uh, again, he, he takes it from kind of an Austrian economist viewpoint, which I don't agree with. At least not for the United States. <clears throat> maybe for the rest of the world, probably not even for the rest of the world. I think pretty much we're all Keynesians now, at least all the people that run the world are Keynesians, because they recognize the one key principle that Keynes had right, that he will never be proved wrong on. And if he is, wow, in the long run, we're all dead. So because of that, debt doesn't necessarily have to be paid. It just has to be rolled affordably. Sometimes the debt level has to come down a little bit, but very rarely at the sovereign level or even corporate level, does it have to go to zero? If you find a company with cash flows that are so strong that they are net debt free, there's several dozen in the S&P 500, and you think their business has enough growth to beat inflation, probably ought to examine them for potential investment. I use a fund, two funds, that just use an algorithm to create a basket. This is important. Shooter keeps an eye on this, the dollar relative to the yen. Now, historically, the yen has been very strong. And it is starting to weaken to the point where they let interest rates get above zero for the first time in a generation. We'll see what happens going forward. I suspect that Japan sees their interest rates rise to around 1% and that the yen remains pretty strong. Because they have a contained economy that is export tech-led. Finance has done very well. Berkshire Hathaway saw it coming years ahead of Hong Kong falling. Someone smart at Berkshire Hathaway, and I don't think it was Warren Buffett, I think it was uh, one of the new guys, Abel or Jane, said, hey, China's going to take over Hong Kong and that's going to destroy the financial market, which it did. How do we invest? And so the two obvious answers became Japan and Singapore. And I think South Korea and Australia, a little bit less. And they bought Japanese brokerages because they're like, these guys are going to get a whole bunch of business or when China invades Hong Kong. And it worked out for them. I think they made 400% in seven years. One of the reasons why Berkshire Hathaway continues to do well. It's also a harbinger of what could happen with Taiwan. Now, I don't think China ultimately invades Taiwan. I think there's a solution there unless, unless Qi just wants to be a tyrant. There is a pragmatic solution to Taiwan if Qi wants. I can't answer that question. I can say there's a deal to be made. I can't say whether the deal will get done. And that's why Berkshire Hathaway sold their Taiwan semiconductor stock. It's why I invest in Intel. Because if China does invade Taiwan, Intel goes to the moon, the head. So when people say, well, why do you invest in Intel? They've had all these hiccups. Right. But they're going to be able to do what Taiwan Semiconductor does about a year and a half from now. That's when everything will be up and running, right? That window was three years, two years, now it's a year and a half away. The government, the U.S. government's giving them all kinds of money to build facilities. They're also giving money to Taiwan Semiconductor, which China invades Taiwan. The Taiwan Semiconductor facilities probably just become their own company. Now, I don't know how that works with the balance sheet. I don't know if there's an transaction. I don't know if they have to eat the losses for what they lose in Taiwan because the Chinese government steals it. The Taiwan Semiconductor stock has been pretty high. Intel's has been pretty low. They're both getting similar checks. One doesn't have Chinese risk. Intel is tiny. Those are the things to think about when you invest. Now, oh, look, it's going up. I should probably buy it. I got to think about it. Oh, look, I just say, oh, yeah, it's great. Oh, yeah, it looks very good. Got a feeling. Look, man, this isn't law and order. Your gut isn't that important. Thinking about what's coming in the future is. And what's coming in the future is that the United States has to have policy that doesn't destroy the world economy. We are the backbone of the world economy. We will remain the backbone of the world economy for generations, if not forever. So when the Fed wants a correction, and I've told you this before, over and over, they can engineer a correction. And that is what they are doing right now with a strong dollar, higher for longer. Oh my, oh my. Inflation went up a tenth of a percent narrative. And once the air is out of this stock market, what will the Fed do? They will change their narrative. So what do we know? We know that more companies, more, excuse me, we know that more parts of the economy are showing lower and lower inflation rates. So this chart shows segments of the economy with inflation below 3%. So more and more segments of the economy, more industries are showing lower inflation. Look at that last. One of the main drivers of inflation is housing. And we know that, as I talked about last year, there's a lot of apartment complexes coming online. 
if you read the article that I forwarded from Bloomberg, excuse me, from The Economist uh, last night, because I'm a very exciting guy on Friday nights, I read The Economist, you saw that the U.S. population, even with the surge in immigration, is still the lowest ever of any decade ever right now. Lowest since the Great Depression. So the growth of the population in the United States is lower than it's ever been. That is a major deflationary pressure that can only be solved by women suddenly having more babies with a 20-year lag on what it impacts the economy or immigration, and then an offset of policy from the Federal Reserve and the federal government. So when people start talking about austerity, when they start talking about cutting spending in the government, if you go to any of the websites that show how the budget is distributed, you realize there's nothing to cut. We have reduced revenue to the federal government by giving 85% of the tax cuts the last 22 years to the richest 1% of people. That is a fact. Simply eliminating those tax cuts, you don't have to raise taxes on anybody else. Just eliminating those tax cuts would almost balance the budget without any cuts. One year of the Trump tax cuts, which amounts to about $350 billion a year, would pay for every initiative that those commie Democrats have proposed by double or triple. Think that through. Almost free education, child care, earned income credit, climate change stuff, all could be paid for by getting rid of the Trump tax cuts on the richest one. <clears throat> I don't know which way we'll vote, but those are just facts. So you have to decide, are you a one percenter with a seven figure income and you really need that tax break of a quarter million dollars a year? That's the average tax for people on top one quarter million dollars. Take that four times the average. So inflation, if we loosened up money by saying, hey, there's a trade-off for those tax cuts now. You have to invest it a certain way, right? Build some houses, build some buildings, rehab some buildings, redevelop something, build a factory. Don't just skim the, the public market. So a combination of regulation and oversight with better tax policy, not necessarily even increases in taxes, just stimulation of growth by changing the way that the tax breaks are structured probably fixes everything. You think Trump or Biden is more likely to do the right thing? Trump already broke it once. So... What has been going on in the market because of all of this? Well, one, the Fed is talking tough. And for a hot minute, the traders, which are the marginal money, the ones that impact price, can move things around a little bit more than normal, than retail panics. We have seen a lot of money flow out of high-yield debt, which is probably appropriate because the spread from high quality to low quality was too narrow. So we were getting a normalization of high-yield rates. And I will probably be ready to buy high yield debt in the not too distant future. Had a chance here, had a chance here. And then way back here, remember we bought high yield debt during COVID, which is an even better. Deal. Certain accounts, I can buy some high yield debt. Not quite yet, soon. Maybe in the next two weeks, maybe in the next two months. So the systematic positioning of the S&P 500 has changed. You can see that we are getting some bifurcation. So the CTAs have sold off about $20 billion in equity in the last week. That's the green line. But the risk parity strategies, the volatility, the vol sellers haven't been as... You can see that the two lines generally move together. So when they bifurcate, the other one catches up. Or they move, in, you know, this one might go up, this one catches direction. So this has to catch up. And once it catches up, wherever it is, whether it's in an uptrend or a downtrend, generally you start to see another change of direction. So you can see pretty easily that the S&P 500 could come down to, well, this 4,700 range, which is what I talked about, is almost there for a broad market. Could it go down further? Well, is there a reason why we can't get down to autumn of 2022 prices? No, there's not a reason that we can't. But take a look at this. One, two, three, four, five. What is that? Somebody in the chat, tell me what that is. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. A, B, C. What is this? One wave, two waves, three waves, four waves, say probably right in here, and then five waves. This is following the exact pattern of a large Elliott wave cycle, like perfectly. What's fractal mean? Fractal means the waves within the waves, the moves within the moves. There should be five. One, two, three, four, five. 
That's Elliott Wave, my friends. And this market is doing it perfect. Now, the way you, this is an easy one to look at. This one is different. You got your one, two, three correction. That's pretty normal. You see there's three, five, or nine waves. This one was five. Then there's wave, little waves within the waves. It's never perfect. Generally plays out pretty close. Big ones are the easiest ones. They're the ones that generally play the cleanest. Little sub waves inside or noise. Traders being traders. Right. Close enough for government work. Shooter says that I got it close to being right. So I feel I'm very proud of myself. Yay. We, um, we want to buy this correction. That's, that's the bottom line. We want to buy this correction. Boom slide. All right. There you go. So the market should finish correcting and then go on a big rally. We can see that the prime books have been shorting more and we're starting to get to an net trading flows down, net buying turned over. So at some point, the alligator draws close. Shorts are increasing. That usually is indicative of a snapback. So what did the rich guys, what did the smart money? We bought emerging markets debt. I did some of that in the 401k plan that I manage. We bought a little bit of Japan. We bought municipal ETFs. Now, when do you buy bonds smart? You buy when rates are high, not because the coupon is spectacular. I mean, it is, it is, it's good, but because you anticipate rates coming down and then you get a capital gain as well. So when I buy distressed debt, when I buy high yield, it's not because of the yield. It's because I'm getting it at a discount that's going to close. Then as that discount closes, people are, you know, then people pile in because they see the share price going off of a fund that's a high yield fund that they're trying to sell it to because the spreads get too narrow. So what we are seeing at the moment in high yield and even in munis is a rewidening of the spreads. And that's why people are buying the munis because that's a pretty good deal already. And the high yield will be a pretty good deal in the next two weeks to two months. What is this? This one's easy. What is that? What do those look like? What is that? What animal? Those are alligator jaws. What do alligator jaws do? Now, if you're new, you're like, what the hell is he talking about? If you've been here, you know. Alligator jaws close. Not always with a snap. Sometimes it's slow motion. This is Europe. People have been piling into European stocks for a couple of years. And they've almost kept up with QQQ. What's going to happen next? What do we know about Europe? They're in slow growth forever. Cyclical trades. There's no secular growth story. They're going to have problems to generation, or at least until energy is cheap. Europe is going to get beat up. If you own European stocks, you're selling. Because when the dollar comes down, this will probably chop, and then this will go up more money rotates to U.S. equity. This just talks about Europe versus uh, Magnus 7. Similar return. They call them the largest, 11 largest. Weekly emerging market flows have remained strong, which I find a little bit surprising. They came down for a while, and lately they've been going up. This is another anticipation that rates are going to come down. So I've shown you the Japan thing. Just looked at Europe. Now we look at emerging markets, the municipal bonds. Why is smart money positioning for a rate decrease? That's probably going to happen. And as I always talk about small caps in the United States, especially as there's more regulation and oversight, but mainly the change in direction of interest causes. Are we closer to bottom than middle or are we closer to middle than bottom? I don't know. Hard to say. I think Shooter is saying a little bit more to the downs. It could be ugly for a couple of weeks. That doesn't mean sell any. At this point, Unless you're already a trader, there's no point. But what you do is if you sold covered calls in February and March, like I told you to, those should start to expire. And if you sold some stock, you need to do some trimming near the top, like I suggested you do in March, you have cash to invest. My message is very simple. You need to be putting together your shopping list right now. Because if anybody panics in two weeks and starts saying, should I sell stuff? I'm going to mock you. Just be prepared for it. Because that's the absolute wrong thing. You're trying to be two months to a year ahead of the game. A year for buying usually because that's when you get your cheapest prices. Two months for doing your trimming. So when there's a big rally that looks parabolic and it just is a little bit too good to be true, you generally want to do your trimming ahead of usually the next earnings or Fed meeting or combination thereof, which is what we have now. You have your Magnificent 7 reporting. I think they're all next week. And here's what you're going to hear. You're going to hear things are okay but they're really not growing that fast. Netflix was your harbinger. Why are they pulling reporting of quarterly growth and subscriptions? It's because they're telling you growth is getting harder. It's going to come down to margin improvement going forward. And that's what they're going to want to make people look at, margin improvement. Bank of America, JP Morgan, all of them are saying that the earnings next week are going to be mediocre. Nothing bad, nothing good, right? Nothing that knocks the knocks the stocks off of people. We've already seen NVIDIA come down. My anticipation is that all of the mega caps come down several percent. I don't think any of them are going to have anything so bad to say that you see 
NVIDIA style corrections, Microsoft, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Apple, Google, Amazon, Meta, they all just have too much. Tesla, I think, is going to take it on the chin because RoboTaxi, bullshit. I'm calling bullshit on that right now. I called bullshit on it four years ago. There is not going to be a RoboTaxi. Why? They're only at level two plus autonomous driving right now. You need level four autonomous driving to do a RoboTaxi. That's why Waymo is having a problem. Even in a geofenced area, they're having a problem because in city streets, it's just too hard. So until the AI and the navigation systems, the navigation systems are almost there, but the AI isn't. The computer vision and AI don't work fast, it's still slower than the human brain when it comes to reaction time for moving a vehicle. So until we have level four autonomous driving, which I told you back in January of 2020 wasn't going to happen this decade, despite all the promises that Musk makes, he's going to promise at earnings to have robo-taxi. He's lying. Why is he lying? Are you paying attention to Tesla? What is the reason that, that Musk is going to tell lies and act indignant and probably tell somebody who asks a hard question to go pound sand? Why is he going to do that? Two real easy answers. Somebody say it. You just want me to go Sam Kinison? Is that it? Are you baiting me? Why is Elon Musk lying? So Scalera, he wants his compensation package to be passed. So he has to promise something huge that is fucking impossible. Zucking impossible. Mm. And that's three F-bombs today. I apologize. That's more than I've had in a couple of weeks. Three coffees. Elon Musk is going to lie about RoboTax. It is not. It's just not. He will couch the lie by saying, we're going to launch it in August, September, maybe in San Francisco, wherever wherever it'll let him do it with a provisional license. It's going to be just like Waymo was the last couple of years, and Waymo ran into problems. Will he be better? Maybe a little bit. In a geofenced area, maybe a little bit better. It's going to be a trial thing. It's not like it's going to generate revenue anytime soon. And this idea that suddenly Tesla is going to overtake Uber and all the cab companies, there's political realities there that just scream bullshit. And I've told you that Elon Musk is looking for an exit from Tesla anyway. Stock price is down, what, 50%? Since I said it was going to drop 50% two years ago, it might drop 30% more. Maybe get a little pop on the lie, and then maybe I can renew my short. I close my short. So I don't talk about my shorting very often, but I do short in my own personal account. I don't do it in client accounts, and I don't give you most of the stock shorts I do. I don't really know that I give you any because I don't want to manipulate the trade because those are thinner margins, and I don't want to be guilty of the same thing that I accuse others of guilty. But I've been buying puts, buying puts on Tesla for about two years. Just took another profit on the ones that expired yesterday. I closed a couple of these early. If we get a pop in Tesla because he promises something that's impossible, and then he gets his pay package approved in June, I will probably buy puts on Tesla again sometime this summer. So if it pops closer to $200 again, I'll buy puts on the anticipation that it ultimately goes down to around 100 There's a couple of perpetually wrong aggressive analysts who have price targets down in the 30s and 40s on Tesla. That is theoretically possible. If you take a look at Tesla from a free cash flow standpoint, you can make that argument. However, from a margin standpoint and the fact that they are still a leader, and I think the one smart thing he might say is that they're not going to do another model car. They're just going to make the Model 3 cheaper and a little smaller with a little less range, get it under 30000 That'd be the smart thing. Now, if he says they're going to do a fifth car or a sixth car, that's bad too. But I think he's actually smart enough to know that Model 3 is his ticket to affordable cars, right? Anybody who wants to go longer distance gets the Model Y because it has more storage capacity. You put the bigger battery. That can be the one with 300 plus miles of range. But if they do a Model 3 basic or model three local model three commute i don't know what name they'll give it and they drop the range down to about 202 miles and that cuts the cost down to twenty nine thousand dollars. that's what i'm interested so my long-term thesis on tesla is that musk is a liar ultimately he has a good thing but that it's been overvalued and if he gets the compensation package he wants, which he doesn't deserve in the least, because Tesla's mo made most of their money on government subsidies so far, if he gets that pay package, I might never invest. But they modify the pay package, especially if they bring in another CEO for 80% less expense, probably just as good, then I'd be real interested. So in my perfect world, Musk lies. He gets called on it. He leaves to go work on rocket ships and AI and whatever else he feels like doing. Siring more children. They bring in a different CEO who says, you know what? We don't need more models. We just got to do this Model 3 thing. And we have to get out of the political business and just ride the wave of EV growth that's coming in a few years. That would interest. But 
if Tesla does actually get beat up this week because people don't believe the lie, which could be true, and I'm writing an article. The title of the article is I am Montana skeptical Tesla right now. Should get some eyeballs. That's a play on somebody who is famous for tussling with, with uh, Elon Musk. So I'm going to try to pick a fight with Elon Musk. Hopefully he noticed me. I did pay my $84 for my little blue check mark for the next one. We'll see what this is. But I do expect the stock market to pull back more in the next two weeks. And then after that, it depends on whether Jay Powell is naughty or nice. Correction could last all the way into June. I don't think it will, but it might. So you're probably on a correction for the next two weeks. Not this week. You can almost do nothing this week. But next week, a day or two before the Fed meeting, you might want to nibble in. You may even want to nibble in, I guess, on Friday. But typically, the markets go up a little bit into the Fed meetings. I don't think it will this. I think people are anticipating mean Jerome Powell because all the Fed presidents have been mean since the last meeting. Goolsby is the only one who's kind of like, yeah, maybe the there's one more. I get, I get my Fed head stuff. Who's who? Who's naughty? Who's nice? With all the retirements in the last couple of years of shares shift, I get my stuff. But I think you probably start nibbling in as this correction expands. And, you know, we don't have to pick pivot points. If you scale in slow, I think you're in pretty good shape. I do think that it becomes very obvious after the next couple of inflation reads, that that's no longer an excuse to keep rates higher. I don't think oil's going any higher unless the war really expands. I mean, that's the wild. So we'll see. If oil gets disrupted in the Middle East, that's a pretty big negative. But at the moment, that's probably the uh, Ukraine and Russia. They passed the aid bill, right? The, uh, the Republicans, the majority of Republicans, actually, uh, which was very good to see, agreed with the Democrats to send aid into various places. <clears throat> And I think that we probably get that second half rally. Most of the analysts have started to catch up with me on their projection for the year. A lot of the analysts, uh, all the investment banks raised their, their year-end targets to 350, 400 after being down at 5,100, 5,200. They're not quite to my 5,700, but I'm going to stick with that. I think that the rally, once the rate cut hits, and if they frame it the way that I think they're going to frame it, which is we're going to lower rates, take off the last hike or two, and then see what is going on because, hey, the economy is really strong. It doesn't need a lot of stimulus. We just have to do a couple tweak, tweaks here, help out the banks, help out homeowners. They can spin it the right way. They're in good shape. And if we've learned nothing else, remember, I was skeptical of Powell at the beginning. Powell's pretty good at creating a narrative. So as a little bit of steam comes out of this market, don't get pessimistic because it's probably a bad idea. Now, if the wrong guy wins in November, spike and crash, baby, spike and crash. But we'll worry about that then. All right, no major markets this week. Uh, Shooter and I are going to change that to only be in monthly uh, because A, not a lot of people show up in the summer. And B, we want a little bit of time off. But really, nothing really changes in the major markets week to week. You know, So we're going to take a look a little bit more robustly at the monthly time frame, And we probably will even not necessarily do it on Saturdays live. We might just record it ourselves and then post. So the major markets uh, are monthly now. Uh, that's where they started. And then we expanded the weekly. So the A, we thought we needed it. Uh, and B, people were watching. But I don't think that it's necessary. Well, we're doing enough here. Watch his primary waves videos. That's where you can get those those looks. Somebody has a question. So with the Metis, I started buying the July $7.50 calls. I'll probably buy some January $7.50 calls, maybe even 10s, but they're small bets. And I think that when rates fall or when they get included on the Russell 2000, you get a, a pretty big rally. I mean, there's just so many things that could happen good for a Metis. There's like nothing bad anymore. I mean, that that's really been uh, de-risked. So, you know, I think that a Metis is a screaming buy under eight, to be honest. So to get it around four is just dirt cheap. And if you want to buy calls, you know, do it because you understand what you're doing and that you have your own exit strategy based on you and what you consider good gains and consistent with your financial goals. I don't really put out articles on call buying. Um, I talk about it in the chat though. So if, if you're going to buy calls on anything, uh, you need to be in the chat rooms over at Fundamental Trends or in the chat room at Marshall Safety Investor. Um, somebody asked about Enphase. Uh, I like Enphase. I think that when you take a look at their balance sheet and their growth and that their unique position in the solar market, that is one of the only must-own solar stocks uh, if you can get it at the right price. Um, I actually haven't looked at the chart in the last or two, but I know that it was in that range where I wanted it. I think I probably end up buying some in the next couple of weeks, that'd be my guess. Uh, and then what about Jackson Churio? 
to be a Hall of Famer. It's just a matter of do the Brewers hold on to him long enough for him to go in with a Brewer, Brewer uh, baseball cap to see the, the guy he's attack. You know, a little bit of rookie growing for he's attack. Brewers are in first place, which uh, a lot of people didn't think. I said that they make a run at the playoffs. They didn't know if they'd quite get there, but the Brewers are pretty good. If they pick up a starting pitcher to replace Burns, boy, oh, boy, that could be uh, – they can make a run. I might have five seasons. All right, everybody. Have a good Saturday, and I will get this edited down. Take care.